suffering in his innermost being. He's like the greatest king on earth, who is above and beyond the power of everyone. No earthly authority, whether pope or prince or parent, can impose a single syllabus of the law upon him. No earthly authority can intrude upon the sanctuary of his conscience, can endanger his assurance and comfort of eternal life. This is the splendid privilege, the inestimable power and liberty that every Christian enjoys. But on the other hand, every Christian is a priest who freely performs good works in service of his or her neighbor and in glorification thereby of God. Christ made it possible, Luther wrote, for us to be not only his brethren, co-heirs, and fellow kings, but also his fellow priests. And thus, in imitation of Christ, we freely serve our neighbors, offering instruction, charity, prayer, admonition, and sacrifice, even to the point of death. We abide by the law of God so far as we are able so that others may see our good work and be similarly impelled to seek God's grace. We freely discipline and drive ourselves to do as, good, as much good as we are able, not so that we may be saved, but so that others may be served. A man does not live for himself alone, Luther writes. He lives only for others. The precise nature of our priestly service to others depends upon our gifts and upon the vocation in which God calls us to use them. But we are all to serve freely and fully as priests of charity. Not everyone who is charitable has faith, but everyone who has faith is charitable. Charity is a form of divine service, of priestly service, whereby God, neighbor, and self are served at once. Such are the paradoxes of the Christian life in Luther's view. We are at once sinners and saints. We are at once lords and servants. We can do nothing good. We can do nothing but good. We are utterly free. We are everywhere bound. The more a person thinks himself a saint, the more sinful, in fact, he becomes. The more a person thinks himself a sinner, the more saintly in fact becomes. The more a person acts like a lord, the more he is called to be a servant. The more a person acts as a servant, the more in fact he becomes a lord. This is the paradoxical nature of human life and this is the essence of human dignity, said Luther. Luther intended his freedom of a Christian tract to be a universal statement for the whole world of Christendom. A summary of the whole of the Christian life in a brief form, as he put it in his preface to Leo, rather triumphantly. He grounded his views in the Bible, liberally peppering his tract with all manner of biblical citations and quotations. He wove into his narrative several strong threads of argument, pulled selectively from a number of church fathers and late medieval Christian mystics. He published his tract both in learned Latin and in simple German, seeking to reach both the scholar and the commoner alike. He wrote with a pastoral directness and emotional empathy, convinced that if he could point out the sinner and saint, the Jekyll and Hyde and everyone, his readers would find both ample humility and ample comfort. So convinced was Luther of the veracity and cogency of his views that he believed even the Jews, the one perennial sojourner in his world of Christendom, would convert en masse to the gospel once they heard it in this simple form. Though this latter aspiration proved fanciful, Luther's views on human dignity and human nature did command an impressive readership amongst Christians. Freedom of a Christian was a bestseller in its day, going through 12 printings in its first two years and five editions by 1524. And it remained a perennial favorite of commentaries and sermons long after Luther's passing and beyond the world of Lutheranism. It's no small commentary on the enduring ecumenical efficacy of Luther's views of human nature, dignity, and freedom that they lie at the heart of the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification 
signed by Catholic and evangelical leaders on October 31, 1999. What all this elegant dialectical theology meant for the nature of political and legal freedom and rule in the world, Luther's little track did not so clearly say. Luther did make clear that all Christians have the freedom and duty to follow the Bible conscientiously and to speak out against human ideas and institutions and practices that conflict with the Bible. The Bible was for Luther the great equalizer of Christians to the remarkable point of allowing Luther, a lowly Augustinian monk from a tiny obscure German town of Wittenberg, to address His Holiness Leo X as if he were the Pope's equal. Luther also made clear that clergy and laity are fundamentally equal in dignity and responsibility before God. The traditional assumption that the clergy were superior to the laity and entitled to all manner of special privileges and immunities and exemptions was anathema to Luther. Luther's doctrine of the priesthood of all believers at once laicized the clergy and clericized the laity. He treated the traditional clerical office of preaching and teaching as just one of many godly vocations that a conscientious Christian could properly and freely pursue. He treated all traditional lay offices as forms of divine calling and priestly vocation, each providing unique opportunities for service to one's peers. Preachers and teachers in the church, he said, must carry their share of civic duties and pay their share of civil taxes just like everyone else. And they should participate in earthly life, such as marriage and family life, just like everyone else. Luther's freedom of a Christian, however, was no political manifesto on freedom. Spiritual freedom may well coexist with political bondage, Luther insisted. The spiritual equality of persons and vocations before God does not necessarily entail a social equality with all others. Luther became doubly convinced of this discordance after witnessing the bloody peasants' revolt in Germany in 1525 and the growing numbers of radical, egalitarian, and antinomian experiments that were engineered in the disfavors theological doctrines of the priesthood of all believers and justification by faith alone. In the course of the next two decades, Luther defended with increasing stridency traditional social, economic, political, and ecclesiastical hierarchies as a necessary feature of this earthly life, a formulation of a social and political structure that he roots ultimately in his two kingdoms theory. That book in the back of the room, written by my wife's husband called The Reformation of Rights, is in some sense the Calvinist answer to this traditionalism of Luther's social hierarchy. Calvinists, taking some of Luther's teachings, began to develop a theory of rights, resistance, and revolution, and saw it as necessary and indeed obligatory on the part of Christians when they faced pervasive and chronic abuse from a tyrant especially abuse of their religious freedom norms, uh, to rise up in revolt against that tyrant and to unseat that tyrant from the throne, and to do that on the strength of the covenantal obligations that citizens had to each other, to God, and to the ruler, which ultimately mandated that a godly commonwealth could not countenance a tyrant. That provides a foundation for many of the later Enlightenment social and government contract theories many of the later constructions uh, of natural or unalienable rights. Those ideas are laid out in detail in the Calvinist tradition with some Lutheran prototypes from the mid-16th to the mid-18th century. And it's no small commentary that by 1650, 150 years before the U.S. Bill of Rights was ratified, every right in the U.S. Bill of Rights had already been defined, defended, and died for by Calvinists. That's a different lecture, a different day, a different story, but it's a thick book that I would commend heartily um, to your uh, review. Uh, and David Jung and Kepra Lee uh, on the fact that here were very generous in providing uh, an expert translation, for which I thank you publicly. 
let's do some reflection now and look at what this whole story means for us today. Nearly five centuries after its publication, Luther's freedom of a Christian still gives a distinct orientation to many contemporary Protestants' instincts about human dignity, human freedom, and human rights. First, Luther's doctrine that a person is at once sinner and saint makes many Protestants today instinctively skeptical about too optimistic a view of human nature and too easy a conflation of human dignity and human sanctity. Such views take too little account of the radicality of human sin and the necessity of divine grace. They give too little credibility to the inherent human need for discipline and order, accountability and judgment. They give too little credence to the perennial interplay of the civil, the theological and educational uses of law, to the perpetual demand to balance deterrence, retribution and reformation in discharging authority within the church, state, home, school, and other associations. They give too little insight into the necessity for safeguarding every office of authority from abuse and misuse. A theory of human dignity that fails to take into account the combined depravity and sanctity of the human person is theologically deficient and politically dangerous. This cardinal insight into the twofold nature of humanity was hardly unique to Martin Luther and is readily amenable to many other formulations. Luther's formula was a crisp Christian distillation of a universal insight about human nature that can be traced to the earliest Greek and Hebrew sources of the Western tradition. The gripping epics of Homer and Hesiod and Pindar are nothing if not chronicles of the perennial dialectic of good and evil virtue and vice, hero and villain in the ancient Greek world. The very first chapters of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible paint pictures of these same two human natures, now with Yahweh's imprint upon them. The more familiar picture is that of Adam and Eve, who were created equally in the image of God, invested with a natural right and duty to perpetuate life, to cultivate property, to dress, and to keep the garden of creation. The less familiar picture is that of their first child, Cain, who murdered his brother Abel, and was called into judgment by God and condemned for his sin. Yet God put a mark on Cain, Genesis reads, both to protect him in his life and to show him that he remained the child of God despite the enormity of his sin. One message of this ancient Hebrew text is that we are not only the beloved children of Adam and Eve who bear the image of God with all the divine perquisites, privileges, and promises of paradise. We are also the sinful siblings of Cain who bear the mark of God with its ominous assurance both that we shall be called into divine judgment for what we have done and that there is forgiveness for even the gravest of sins we may have committed. Luther believed that it's only through faith and hope in Christ that a person can ultimately be assured of divine forgiveness and eternal salvation. He further believed that it was only through a life of biblical meditation, prayer, worship, charity, and sacramental living that a person could hold his or her depravity in check and aspire to greater sanctity, however incomplete. I believe that too, as do many Christians today. But that is not to say that in this life Christians have the only insights into the twofold nature of humanity and the only effective means of balancing the realities of human depravity and the aspirations for human sanctity. Any religious tradition that takes seriously the sinner and saint, the Jekyll and Hyde in all of us, has its own understanding of ultimate reconciliation of these two natures and its own methods of balancing them in this life. 
And who are we Christians ultimately to say how God will ultimately judge these? Luther also believed that the ominous assurance of the judgment of God is ultimately a source of comfort, not of fear. The first sinners in the Bible, Adam, Eve, and Cain, were given what Luther called divine due process. They were confronted with the evidence, asked to defend themselves, given a chance to repent, spare the ultimate sanction of death, and then assured of a second day trial on the day of judgment with appointed divine counsel, no less. The only time in the New Testament that God deliberately withheld divine due process, Luther reminds us, was in the capital trial of his son. And in Christian teachings, that was the only time it was and has been necessary. The political implications of this are very simple. It, if God gives due process in judging us, we should give due process in judging others. If God's tribunals feature at least basic rules of procedure and evidence and representation and advocacy, human tribunals which represent the political office of God should at least feature the same. The demand for due process is a deep human instinct, and it has driven Protestants over the centuries, along with many others before and with them, to be strident advocates for procedural rights. Second, Luther's doctrine of the lordship and priesthood of all believers renders many Protestants instinctively jealous about liberty and equality, but on their own distinctive theological terms. In the modern liberal tradition, liberty and equality are defended on grounds of popular sovereignty and inalienable rights. The American Declaration of Independence in 1776 proclaimed it a self-evident truth that all men are created equal and are endowed with certain unalienable rights. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 proclaimed that all men are born free and equal in rights and in dignity. Protestants can resonate more with the norms of liberty and equality in these documents than with the theories of popular sovereignty and inalienable rights that often undergird them. The heart of the Protestant theory of liberty is that we are all lords on this earth. We are utterly free in the sanctuary of our consciences, utterly unencumbered in our relationships with God. We enjoy a sovereign immunity from any human structures and strictures, even those of the church, when they seek to impose upon this divine freedom. Such talk of sovereign immunity sounds something like modern liberal notions of popular sovereignty, and such talk of lordship sounds something like a democratic right to self-rule. And Protestants have thus long found ready allies and humanists and liberals and many others who advocate liberty of conscience and democratic freedoms on these grounds. But when theologically pressed, many Protestants will defend liberty of conscience not because of their own popular sovereignty, but because of the absolute sovereignty of God, whose relationship with his children may not be trespassed. Many Protestants will defend certain unalienable rights, not in the interest of preserving their own personal privacy, but in the interest of discharging their divine duties. The heart of the Protestant theory of equality is that we are all priests before God, and priests of God. The Bible says many times over, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. Among you there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. These and many other biblical passages, which Luther highlighted and glossed repeatedly, have long inspired a reflexive egalitarian impulse in Protestants. All are equal before God. All are priests that must serve their neighbors. All have vocations that count. All have gifts to be included. The common calling of all to be priests transcends differences of culture, gender, economy, and more. 
Such teachings have led a few Protestant groups over the centuries to experiment with intensely communitarian states of nature where life is gracious and lovely and long. But most Protestant groups view life in such states of nature as brutish, nasty, and short, for sin invariably perverts them. Strictures and structures of law and authority are necessary and useful, Protestants believe. But such strictures need to be as open, egalitarian, and democratic as possible. The hierarchy is a danger to be indulged only so far as necessary. <laughs> to be sure, Protestants over the centuries have often defied these founding ideals and have earnestly partaken of all manner of elitism and chauvinism and racism and anti-Semitism and tyranny and patriarchy and slavery, apartheid, and much more. And they have sometimes engaged in outrageous hypocrisy and casuistry to defend such shameful pathos. But an instinct for equality and egalitarianism for embracing all persons equally, for treating all vocations respectfully, for arranging all associations horizontally, for leveling the life of the earthly kingdom so none is obstructed in access to God, is a Lutheran gene and the theological genetic code of Protestantism. Third and finally, Luther's notion that a person is at once free and bound by the law has powerful implications for our modern understanding of human rights. For Luther, the Christian is free in order to follow the commandments of the faith. Or in more familiar and general modern parlance, a person has rights in order to discharge prior duties. Freedoms and commandments, rights and duties belong together in Luther's formulation. To speak of one without the other is ultimately destructive. Rights without duties to guide them quickly become claims of self-indulgence. Duties without rights to exercise them quickly become sources of deep guilt. Protestants have thus long translated the moral duties set out in the Decalogue into reciprocal rights. The first table of the Decalogue prescribes duties of love that each person owes to God to honor God and God's name, to observe the Sabbath day of rest and holy worship, to avoid false gods and false swearing. The second table prescribes duties of love that each person owes to neighbors, to honor one's parents and other authorities, not to kill, to commit adultery, to steal, to bear false witness, or covet. Church, state, and family alike are responsible for the communication, exemplification, and enforcement of these cardinal moral duties, Protestants have long argued, but it's also the responsibility of each person to ensure that his or her neighbors discharge their moral duties. And this is one important impetus for Protestants to translate duties into rights. A person's duties toward God can be cast as the rights of religion, the right to honor God in God's name, the right to rest and worship on one Sabbath, the right to be free from false gods and false oaths. Each person's duties toward a neighbor, in turn, can be cast as a neighbor's right to have that duty discharged. One person's duties not to kill, to commit adultery, to steal, or to bear false witness thus gives rise to another person's rights to life, to property, to fidelity, to reputation. For a person to insist on vindication of these latter rights is not necessarily to act out of self-love. It is also to act out of neighborly love. To claim one's own right against a neighbor is in part a charitable act to induce one's neighbor to discharge his or her divinely ordained duty. <clears throat> Some 35 years ago, standing at a lectern similar to this one, the great American jurist Grant Gilmore put what he took to be the most enduring legal lesson of Protestantism. Gilmore said, the better the society, the less law there will be. In heaven there will be no law, and the lion will lie down with the lamb. 
in hell there will be nothing but law, and due process will be meticulously observed. This is a rather common Protestant sentiment, which Luther did much to propound in some of his early writings. But a Protestant faithful to Luther's most enduring insights might properly reach the exact opposite projection. In heaven, there will be pure law, and thus the lamb will not lie down with the lion. In hell, there will be no law, and thus all will devour each other eternally. Heaven will exalt due process, and each will always receive what's due. Hell will exalt pure caprice, and no one will ever know what's coming. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor John Reed, for your excellent speech about the freedom of our Christian, uh, especially Martin Luther's reformation of law and liberty in mind and heart. Uh, those who could not follow his English, maybe you could read in Korean at the end of this program. So it's now time for open discussion. Any one of you can raise any kind of question.